Well, good afternoon if you are in Lima, Peru, or good morning. It's still afternoon and morning in Lima, Peru, where I know we have listeners in New York City, anywhere in between. If you are in the Canton Ticino, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, anywhere else in Europe or Africa, special love and care and attention to our loved ones in Ukraine, we are with you. And greetings to people all around the world. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. Idajo is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. My guest today is a very busy and very accomplished Italian maestro. Italy, and it seems especially Milan and Genoa, I don't know why, <clears throat> but Milan and Genoa seem to produce a lot of great conductors. Maybe we'll get into that today. Today's guest is Giampaolo Bizanti, who joins us from the Canton Ticino, which is the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. Benvenuto, welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, Fred. Hi, everybody. So in the Canton Ticino, do people speak mostly Italian? Do they also speak Ladino and other local languages and German and French. So yeah, exactly. very cosmopolitan. But you were born and grew up in Milan. Yeah, correct. And I observed to Giampaolo, who in our setting up this conversation, has been a model of precision and punctuality and timeliness and thoroughness. He's been a dream to work with in preparing this. And he said to me, well, I learned that from my father. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, Fred, I was born in a very, very big family because I am the oldest of 11 children. Wow. And my father was born in southern Italy. Then at a very young age, he moved to, us, uh, to Milan in order to, to find a job and uh, to, to raise a family. And uh, he taught us... Uh, a lot regarding uh, working hard, being precise, being loyal, and uh, and study and achieve uh, our our dreams uh, and whatever we wanted to. That's why I I feel so um, responsible towards uh, the world, towards people, and to be precise and loyal at all times. Where in southern Italy is he from? <clears throat> Sorry He's for from, clearing my throat. No, no problem. He's from uh, Puglia. He was born in uh, in uh, in uh, Taranto, mm -hmm. uh, in a small village next to Taranto. He's What's very, the name very, of the village? The village is Pulsano. I've where been there. You can find one of the most of the cleanest sea in in the whole world. <laughs> and but I never visited that city because. Uh, I, uh, it's, a, it's a very weird, uh, weird, weird story. I have been conducting all over Italy until 2016 when I was hired in uh, Teatro Petruzzelli di Bari as a music director. That was my first chance to, uh, to visit the whole region. It's one of the most beautiful in the world. So I'm going to talk a bit and ask you if there's a way you can increase your volume. Um, Puglia is the heel of the Italian boot. It is the flattest region in, in Italy, which means that it has a huge fertile plain for wheat and much of the pasta, phenomenal breads come from Puglia. Some of the best yes. bread in the world comes from Puglia. It grows and produces more olive oil than any other region of Italy and is famous for almonds among many things. It is the the heel that sticks out is the easternmost part of Italy, it's southeast, and the heel has the lower part is called the Salento, yeah. which is a wonderful red wine growing area. Yeah. Bari is one of the most important cities in Italy. It's very large. The local accent, they say Bari. And the thing that's <laughs> notable about the food of Puglia is that the, the shapes of the food, Tarali, are very circular. Uh, orecchiette look like little ears. Yes. These are some of the oldest shapes. It's like reading the alphabet of food 
because these are the original shapes of the food from two or 3,000 years ago. And um, you mentioned your father is from near Taranto. Taranto is particular because uh, it's where the tarantella comes from, the musical form. And that's because the tarantula, the <clears throat> insect, the spider, I don't know what it is, um, is from there and they could be poisonous. So a dance evolved of trying to step on and kill the tarantula and that's called the tarantella. Exactly. So um, this also happens to be an area that produces remarkable oysters, Osterike, especially near Taranto. Um, yes. The fish along the coast is remarkable. There is a a phenomenon called the transumanza, which goes back to ancient times. This is the northern part of the region in which animals, transhumans means the migration of humans and animals, and they go from Molise, which is inland, to the town of Foggia, where they were unfortunately for them slaughtered. Yeah. And the rhythms and the culture, the sense of ancient Italy, yeah. to me is more palpable in Puglia than it is in Rome because Rome has been built on with every century with different things but you can feel antiquity in Puglia it's a remarkable you know, place you know my country better than me That's I amazing. know Italians <laughs> call me to ask where to eat literally <laughs> they do exactly the one but Puglia, um, if you if you take if you take the car and you drive from Gargano southbound until the, uh, the final edge of Salento, it takes more than four hours. That means that the Puglia region is huge. And wherever you go, every single village, every single place of that region, you can experience different di dialect, you can experience different food, you can experience different mood of the people because every, especially in, for example, in Bari, you have different di dialect inside the town, if you go to Bari Vecchio, if you go to Bari Nuova, and uh, you, you said uh, about the food, if you, if you take a walk uh, into the um, Bari Vecchia town, you can still see uh, old women sitting outside and preparing orecchiette by themselves, the real orecchiette, a tradition that lasts from uh, ancient times. And that's why I was double lucky because I could stay in Puglia for work and at the same time experience that culture I didn't experience so far. In fact, in one of my books that I published about 25 years ago, I have a picture of a nice um, Benestante, a rather yes. large woman yeah. seated outside in body with her wooden board in front of her. And people yeah. would walk by and say, buongiorno and talk. And as they did that, she just kept making orecchiette for hours. Yeah. Her hands moving the whole time while talking and smiling. It's, it's really like something out of an opera. Yes. There's no that's other way why, to describe it. That's why uh, tourists, they come um, every year to Puglia. And sometimes Salento, now, nowadays Salento has become one of the uh, most uh, frequented places in Italy. And I can say that sometimes it's too much because for example, the mayor of Porto Cesario is, is next to um, Gallipoli, those places in Italy. Uh, this year he said, we are not able to host anybody else because there is no space there are uh, no hotel rooms available and it, it it's getting it's getting hard to host and to welcome so many people i think they have they should uh, reduce the number of the tourists there in order to keep everything clean and to keep uh, um, the lifestyle at the at the highest 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 level otherwise when it's too crowded it can be it can be not good, I guess. Yeah. Or perhaps people should go to different parts of Puglia. It's very large. There's something in Puglia called the Masseria. The Masseria Ooh. is a very old institution. It's a farm that's built with sort of a building surrounding the agriculture. And they did that yeah. because when there were either plagues or attacks from vandals and, and people from up north, um, this formed a protection and these beautiful masseria, these buildings now have become hotels. 
Yes. And they're very, very beautiful. Um, and they are throughout the region of Puglia. So you, everybody does not have to go to the same three towns in the Salento. In the Salento, by the way, is a town called Manduria. Have you been Manduria. there? Yes, it's next to my father's village. Okay, so Manduria yes. is particular because it is one of the oldest Jewish settlements in Italy. Oh, I didn't know. There's Pitigliano in southern Tuscany. There's Rome. The Jewish settlement in Venice came later because Venice is a younger city than the rest of them. But Manduria was where a lot of people arrived from the Middle East and settled there. So the buildings are higher because the Jews were not allowed to go out after a certain hour. So they built taller buildings and they lived in there. And there's a very famous wine grape from there called Primitivo. Oh, it's a red grape. One that, of the best um, red wine ever. It's, it's a wonderful wine. And it wound up because of vandals and invasions. It wound up in Hungary and was renamed Zinfandel oh. and later wound up in California. And is a very popular wine grape in California. But its origins are in the town of Manduria in Puglia. So I know we could talk about this forever yeah. because it's a passion of mine <laughs> and it seems of yours. But I want to talk to you about the Teatro Pedruzzelli in body because Italy has what are known as the sort of the 14 exactly. institutional 14. theaters yeah. that are funded by the government. There are foundations, some of them, the famous ones are La Scala and Rome and Genova and Bologna, Florence, La Fenice, right. Trieste, um, Cagliari, Palermo, Napoli, Napoli. Catania. No, Catania and not. Catania, you're right, is a tradition. Uh, is, uh, is a different, it's not, it's not. Um, but uh, then another one of these, oh, of the 14 happens to be the Teatro Pedruzzelli. Yes. And I've not yet had a guest on this series who has worked there. I've worked there and I, you're there very importantly now. Talk about that theater and the city and the way the connection between this beautiful theater, which had a fire, a very serious yes, fire, exactly. and, um, and the city of Bari in the region of Puglia. Yeah, um, as I told you, Bari was the last opera house I, I conducted in. I was invited uh, in the uh, spring 2016 to conduct the Tosca as a guest conductor. And uh, afterwards, the intendant was searching for a music director, and I was asked to, be, to become the music director. The challenge was, uh, was exciting for several reasons. First reason, I fell in love with that opera house as I entered this opera house, because it's the fourth largest uh, opera house in Italy. Um, the number of the seats was, uh, was reduced, but, uh, but it's still a very, very big opera house. In, uh, inside, when you, when, you, when you step inside, you can, uh, be, uh, you, can, you, can, you can feel how amazing this opera house is. It was reconstructed very well, but throughout the um, uh, almost 20 years, uh, of uh, the reconstruction, the audience could not experience any opera because they moved everything to Teatro Piccini, but Piccini was so small and so out of hand. So um, Bari was uh, without an opera house for many, many years. As they reopened it, the uh, audience, they embraced the opera house uh, once again. And I arrived in a very particular time, in a very particular period because there was, um, um, they had no music director. And I think the music director is very important. A music director is someone who does not conduct more titles than others. The music director is responsible for the level of the orchestra. And, is, and above all, I put my face outside and said, I am the musical director of Tatro Petrucelli in Bari. I take this uh, opera house in esteem and I want to uh, to uh, bring this orchestra and this opera house at the highest level ever. Therefore, I, uh, I accepted this challenge because there, there was, I, I found a brand new orchestra in this opera house, mm. very young people, very motivated people. And I worked a lot to, uh, to increase the level of the orchestra. Uh, alongside a 
very efficient staff starting from the intendant. Uh, we are uh, throughout the first two or three years, I uh, organized um, a lot of rehearsal with uh, orchestra, with sessions, for example, first violin, second violin, viola, um, facing the, the, the all, the, all the possible repertoire we could. And uh, after a few years, we were able to, uh, uh, to uh, set productions, very important productions. And especially in the symphonic and symphonic repertoire, we are, we are hosted the most renowned and famous uh, um, players in the world. Polodosh, Polini, Pletniev, uh, Marta Argerich, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. Therefore, I'm so proud of uh, Teatro Petruzzelli. I'm also proud of myself because we, we worked a lot uh, to achieve these results. And these the results today were so satisfying for us. So I'm just remembering, if I'm correct, Carlo Maria Giulini is from Bari. No, uh, Carlo Maria Giulini is from Barletta. Barletta, which is very close, but he's from Puglia. Muti is from Mulfetta. Right. Riccardo. Giulini from Barletta. Yes. And Beniamino Gigli was from Puglia? Uh, I don't remember. A famous tenor. I know that yes, one of the big, of not Caruso, who was from Campania, but no, it could exactly. be. exactly. Yes. And while you were talking, I remembered something that I forgot about. I was telling you about these nice, beautiful, large women in, in, in body who sit and they make um, beautiful things with their hands for cooking. Yeah. One of my friends is one of those ladies. She doesn't sit on the street. She sits inside, but she's from body and she loves music and terribly missed music when it was not there. Yeah. And when she and I were speaking, she used a term that I had never heard before. And I asked her whether it's typical of body or whether it's elsewhere. And she didn't know that the musicians of the orchestra in body are known as the professori d'orchestra, in other words, the professors of the orchestra, yes. which sounds wonderful. Is that a term you know, and is it used elsewhere? All around, all around, all around. All around. Okay. But They're what could that, I love it, but what could that mean, professori d'orchestra? Okay, in, in French, for in a, in, a, in, a, in a French language, they don't use professor. Professor is something else. But in Italy, when you uh, get a diploma in the conservatorio, you are named maestro. Whatever, whatever you, you do, you are a violin player, you are a conductor, you are a composer. But when you, um, when you talk to them, you, uh, you name them professori. Scusate, professori. When you talk to people of the choir, you say artisti del coro. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's quite long, but they, they love to be called Artisti del Coro. That's it. Well, these are wonderful details about Italy, the nation I love, but it's, it says so much about the relationships in the society. I have an Italian university degree, degree so I'm called Dottore. Dottore yes. Not that I use it, but I mean, I could if I wanted to. And these are in English are called honorifics, these titles. Yes. And the further south you go in Italy, the long ingegnere, cavaliere, uh, all of them. Yes. And they're wonderful. But I often wonder, and I, I'd like to know your opinion as a man whose roots are in the south, but grew up in the north. The degree to which if someone has a title, does that separate them in some way? Um, I know that sometimes I hide the fact that I have an Italian university degree because I want to interact with everybody equally, and I don't feel that my degree makes me special. Yes. You know, the person, the husband of this woman who bakes the most magnificent breads, to me, he's a genius in a way that I could never be. Yes. So, um, but I, I find sometimes in Southern Italy that people look for titles and they want me to use my titles. How You as a maestro, which is a big title, how do, how do you experience this in the South and in the North and then well, elsewhere in the world? 
Yes, uh, if you go to Napoli, every, everybody says dottore to you. <laughs> well, even, even if you're not a dottore. Well, formally speaking, when you, uh, when you graduate at a university, you take a degree, uh, you are dottore. Dottore in medicine, dottore in law. And uh, when, you, when you call somebody professore, it, the meaning is, is slightly different because professore is a dottore who is uh, really, really uh, uh, specialized in something. Professore in biologia, professore in matematica, and so on. In southern Italy, um, when, uh, when you call somebody dottore, it has a very, very strong meaning. Very, very strong meaning is a sort of uh, is a is a sort of respect form towards somebody. But uh, getting back to the to the opera world, when you when you want to talk to to the orchestra, you always say professore. Never you 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 never say maestro because maestro is the conductor or maestro is most of the times is the intendant. Intendant being the general manager, general director, general manager, director of the company. Exactly. Yeah. The superintendent. So when you take this cult, beautiful culture behind you, but then say you're working in Belgium or Seattle yeah. or Oman in the Middle East, where the societies are very different, how does this translate or not? And if you enter, Seattle is a wonderful city. You were there recently, um, but it's a very casual city. The human interactions are very informal. Yes, exactly. And you can also feel it in the audience. How, how warm is the audience? How, uh, sometimes the audience uh, claps when it wouldn't be supposed to. It means that the audience uh, is so excited to listen to music and to participate the, uh, the, the performance. It was my very first time in the United States. In the United States, it was so successful. I, I spent a wonderful time there, more than one month and a half, working with a fantastic orchestra, uh, and, uh, and uh, I could appreciate the organization of the stuff of the Seattle Opera. And I also was so surprised because in Italy, for example, uh, the um, Enti Lirici, all the opera houses are supported by the government economic, economically. And in the United States, they don't get any, 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 any money from the government. So it's all about fundraising. And I, I was so touched by people donating money to the Opera House because they still uh, feel uh, the, um, the Opera House like a, an important part of the society, an important, uh, 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 an, an important uh, house. In, 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 in a, I, I just experienced Seattle so far. Right. Uh, I, I think Seattle is particular because it's the home of Boeing and Microsoft and Amazon and these massive corporations. There. Everything. And is there. there's a lot of money in Seattle to go around. But unfortunately, a lot of opera companies in America have to go with their hands out trying just to survive. And we have wonderful companies in America of all sizes, not just the big ones like the Met in Chicago and San Francisco, Houston, Los Angeles. Then the next tier, which are things like Atlanta and Seattle and Dallas is a wonderful company. All, they're wonderful, but we have very small, beautiful companies. New York City has 40 opera companies. Um, places like Des Moines and Omaha. Cincinnati is a wonderful company. The Opera Theater of St. Louis, Santa Fe and festivals um, all over Florida, their opera companies. But um, it's a struggle. And yes. a lot of time and effort, a lot of money has to be spent to try to raise money oh, when yes. you would rather use the money to invest in art. So we could talk about that another time because I would like, frankly, to talk to you about things that you are very special about it. And one of the things in doing preparation that I realized is because we really are just speaking for the first time, I'm not sure you're aware of the depth of my love for Giuseppe Verdi that yeah. goes beyond his wonderful music, but I love the man. He's my hero. Yeah. And I'll mention this because Adagio has just announced that I will be doing a four-part series for Adagio on September 19th, 26th. 
October 3 and October 10, Verdi's birthday, that people have to enroll in, and there will be a fee for that, um, called Making Sense of Verdi, in which I will cover as much of Verdi as I can do in four 90-minute sessions, and we will have guests, singers, conductors, whoever I have that are appropriate for the different days. And Verdi, depending who you ask, wrote 26, 27, 28 operas. Um, and probably the least known of the 26, 7, or 8 is called Alcira. And yes. you are planning to conduct Alcira. I have studied Alcira. Um, listeners may know that in Parma, there's yes. something called the Club of the 27. They've decided yes, he wrote 27 yeah, operas. Yeah. And each member, they're all men, not because they exclude women, but the women have their own club for Verdi. But yes. this club, each man does not go by his Christian name, but by the name of his opera. And I, a number of years ago, was a very happy guest there for their club, and I gave a speech. And each night they divide the the responsibilities so i was presented by il trovatore yes. i was invited by falstaff yes. um la traviata was the the person the man who served the food and alcida cooked and i asked alcida to come out of the kitchen to compliment him on, on his excellent parma cooking yes. and i i asked him i said how does it feel to be the person representing the opera that's the least known opera by Giuseppe Verdi. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a huge honor because yeah. it, it, it takes place. Uh, it is, will be my very first. Uh, well, let opera. me just tell you how he answered. And then I do want to talk about the opera, El Cira. He yeah. said that because he's the responsible person to yeah. know everything about the opera and most people feel they know La Traviata and Rigoletto and Aida, yes. Yes. that there's enough to discuss. But he is the authority on Alcira. So I made a point of talking to him more than all the other members because yes. that was the opera I needed to learn. So let me ask you now, you are preparing to conduct Alcira in Liège in Belgium, in is that true? Yes. Talk about it. Oh, um, I was just appointed musical director, Opera Royal de Valonie in Liège. And uh, the first two titles of my seasons are of my season are Alzira and Sonnambula. And this is was a, the second one was Sonnambula. Uh, Sonnambula. We have a Bull plane flying over New York. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, Sonnambula Bellini. It was it, it will be the second opera I will conduct in the edge. And uh, we chose Alzira because it is very important to uh, perform uh, unknown operas. There are so many that are still uh, are, are in the limbo, you know, there are so many operas, for example, by Donizetti that are never performed because they're not attractive. They say they're not attractive, although uh, many pages of this opera, Parisina d'Este, Maria de Rudens, they have a fantastic, fantastic arias and, and fantastic music worth to be discovered and worth to be performed. Alzira, uh, within the uh, operas by Verdi is, uh, is not, has not a very good appeal because they say, and also from holding back the years, uh, it was not uh, it, it was a, not a success. It was uh, considered a very uh, awful opera by audience and critics. But it's our duty. Uh, it belongs to the Verdi production, to the young Verdi productions. Uh, production and we have the duty to uh, let the audience listen to this. Listen to this. Of course, Verdi himself said it's a really, really awful opera. I don't like it. But I say some arias, some duets, the concertato of the uh, first act, for me, uh, uh, are very, very good pieces very, very well written. Maybe the story is not in interesting as uh, comparing to other operas, but we're so proud that Liège has the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, will. They want to propose uh, this kind of uh, unknown and, and not so famous operas to the audience. Well, I, in my research, I've found that 
the initial response in the Tatra San Carlo in Naples, where it premiered, yeah. was very positive. But then it kind of evolved where it was less positive. And, you know, this can happen where a work of art gets a label on it or a burden on it. And we come to assume that it was not good. But at the opening, the audience was incredibly enthusiastic and the Neapolitans know opera. So they would not be enthusiastic if they didn't like it. Um, there's music, especially, as you said, the overture. Yeah. And there's an opening chorus that's yes. quite wonderful, yes. um, which is about the Americani, the Americans. Because the reason I said today that we have people listening in Lima, Peru, yeah, is that yeah. this opera is set in Lima, Peru. Yes. So it's sort of unusual. La Forza del Destino has the South American, but Verdi didn't spend too much time subject-wise in South America. Yeah. And it's adapted from a tragedy by Voltaire yes. called Alcide, in other words, Alcide, ou les Américains. Yeah. Yes. So therefore, the concept for Voltaire in the 1740s of America was, you could say, either a savage place or an unexplored place. It was very exotic. And therefore, he could create a story that includes Incas and gold and treasures and tribes and Spanish exactly. uh, conquerors and the relationships between the local peoples and the conquering peoples. And that's a theme throughout Verdi. And we see it in Aida, we see it all over the place. We see it in Don Carlo. And so therefore, I love looking at early operas by Verdi that maybe we don't know, yeah. because we discover the, the germs, the beginning of the idea that led to these masterpieces that he later did, and how he would explore. He later did Attila, and one of the members of the cast, Filippo Coletti, with the baritone, um, wound up being Ezio in Attila, who utters the most famous line for me in all of Verdi, avrai tu l'universo, resti l'Italia me, you can have the universe, let Italy yes. be mine, yes. which is going on my tombstone. And Verdi was inspired meeting Coletti to even consider that. So we have Alcira to thank for Attila and therefore for that famous line. It's all connected. Yes. And it, he created a soprano role, the role of Alcida, that I think is a step forward musically from what he did, let's say, in Ernani that came soon before. Um, and, and therefore, these are important steps. And as you said, it's crucial that we present these works. Yes. And maybe when Alcida is revived... Uh, in a few years, you'll bring it back with another later Verdi, Verdi work that maybe has the influence of Alcira, even yeah. Aida, for example, yeah. Yeah. as a means of doing that. So how are you preparing an opera and an opera production that people know nothing about? That will be part of your introduction to the people of Liège. Yes, 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 yes. First of all, I would like to meet as much as possible the audience and uh, because you have to, okay, when you, when you propose Traviata, Rigoletto, Trovatore, Don Carlo, people already know the music, they already know the stories, they have been listening uh, for, for decades to this music. In this case, I guess nobody has listened to Alzira so far. Therefore, I, uh, my purpose is to meet as much as possible people uh, organizing meetings and uh, speak, uh, try to speak very, very easily to people, giving musical examples in order to let them get into this music and, uh, and uh, make them, uh, make them experience, uh, for example, the most, the most uh, important and the most uh, full of tension parts of the opera. The overture, the uh, the first chorus, moya moya, or the uh, stretta del prologo uh, at the end of the prologo, the beginning uh, of the first act uh, with the chorus, the concertato of the, on the, on the of the first act. First of all, describing the story, describing the uh, the uh, the uh, the story and how this story is related to music because Verdi was a fantastic composer. Verdi was one of the, 
I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unicum, as we say, because he started out at 26 with Oberto Conte di San Bonifacio, the first opera that has a sort of, uh, is a sort of Tardo Donizetti opera style until the open forms of the Ballet Maschera, Aida, Otello, Faustaf, and so on, is a sort of miracle. And each opera of Verdi deserves respect and, de and deserves to be fully rely understood, understood. This is my purpose. Th th there are many, many, uh, there, there is a lot of very strong music inside, inside this opera. Yeah. And if you lead people uh, simply, simply not, not I, I don't want to, to, to organize uh, lessons because people wouldn't be able to understand. If you lead people and you, if you take their hands and you, and, and you, and you uh, inspire them, I think we will make a very good job. What's notable to me people, too that people, this difficult opera. It is. This opera, yeah. um, Alcira, I need to double check it. I should know this. Is either the first or the second Verdi opera named for a woman? Yes. Yeah, it's either that or Giovanna d'Arco, but it's I think Giovanna d'Arco, exactly. It's this yes. one first, maybe. They come sort of together. It um, comes and after Giovanna d'Arco. After, was okay. 1940. Uh, 1845, I guess. Yeah. Yes, Giovanna d'Arco is just a little earlier. Hernani was 44. Yeah. Um, so therefore, when an opera by Verdi is named for a woman, that already is a distinct step forward from Oberto, from Nabucco, yes. from Hernani, which are named for men. Yes. And the focus goes to a woman in this opera. And the soprano who sang it was named Eugenia Tadolini. Tadolini. Yes. And the thing about Eugenia Tadolini, she was a big star. Apparently, she's a very beautiful woman, and Verdi liked her stage presence. He felt that the voice was very beautiful, very well produced. And when she sang Lady Macbeth in the opera Macbeth later on, Verdi was a little disapproving because the voice was too beautiful. Uh, she sang Elvira in Ernani, but she was born in 1809, but we don't know what happened to her. She kind of disappeared. And it's interesting because most of the big opera stars of the 19th century, we know something about. We know she died after 1851, but she just like Greta Garbo, she disappeared. Yes. And she stopped singing and, and then she was gone. And I've done as much research as I can do, yes. uh, but I can't find it. And the reason that I'm raising this is when you're casting the role of Alcida, yeah. we tend to look at models of people who sang the role. I mean, we can have our idea of who should be Violetta and so on. Yes. But again, with this one, you don't have the frame of reference because we know so little about Tadolini that we can't, if she's if Verdi disapproved, or we know that he disapproved of her Lady Macbeth because it was too beautiful. Yes it gives us some idea of what he liked. He liked her in this. He thought she was yeah. fine and he liked her in Hernani. So how do you set about to find a soprano or two yeah. to sing this almost unknown role? And how do you work with her and have other people work with her yeah. to evolve, to create something that hasn't existed for 150 years, more than yes. 150 years? Yes, that's correct. Uh, talking about Macbeth, uh, it's true because Verdi, uh, Verdi used to write, I need a voice that, that must be an ugly voice, like, screaming like a demon. Therefore, uh, okay, Macbeth is, a, is an exception, you know. Anyway, um, I'm working on operas like Alzira requires um, this, this operas, like most of the Donizetti opera, requires very, very powerful voices, very, very good voices, very strong voices. So it's not very easy to find voices like this. It's, it's much easier finding a Violetta or a Gilda nowadays. When you have to hire somebody, you have to look around in advance for a reliable uh, soprano, reliable tenor that can face this kind of operas because it is as unknown as difficult, like many operas that are not staged nowadays. 
for example, Donizetti is, is one of these examples. Therefore, we were so lucky to, um, to have Francesca Dotto accepting the, uh, the, the role. Of you say here. Jessica Gould? Sorry? Who was the name of the person? Francesca Dotto. Francesca, Francesca Dotto, Dotto, very good. Yes, is, uh, is facing the role for the very first time. I know yeah. her, I, I, didn't, I didn't work with her so far, but I rely on her because she's a very serious singer. She has achieved a very good career, so we will... In Iliash, we have we are lucky because we can uh, we we have a lot of time to rehearse to rehearse alongside the director the, and all, all the singers and so on. Therefore, uh, I also remember that Virginia Ziani sang this role. If I'm mm -hmm. not if I'm not wrong, okay. So we have. So to just to give listeners a context, Virginia Ziani is a legendary singer who is still alive. Yes, she's exactly. near a hundred. Yes, um, yes. I worked with her, I think, in 2010 yes. because she was in the original cast of Poulenc's Dialogues of the Carmelites. Yes. And a production was being done in Texas that I was invited to work on. And she came to help work with the singers, which was a wonderful thing. Yeah. And the last time I checked, and I hope is still the case, she's in excellent health and still teaching and lives in Florida. Yes. And uh, so it's rather, have you been in touch with Virginia Zayani? Yes. No, oh, never, good. never, never, never. Oh, no, never. you should want to try that. <laughs> oh, I, I don't mean to, to come be... sing, but I mean to give you advice no, about no. the opera. <laughs> yes, I, I could invite her. This would be a very, very good, very good suggestion. Good yeah. And also, it only reminds me that uh, the tenor of uh, one production a long time ago was Gianfranco Cecchi as well, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I, I remember that it was a very young guy making, uh, making a lot of experience, gaining a lot of experience in a, in a very small village called Bassano del Grappa. They organized in Veneto. They organized uh, every year two titles pro season. And I was hired for seven years. In, and I was so lucky because I could, I could gain a lot of experience. I could, I could work with orchestra and and uh, and experience orchestra. in a spot at Gibianchi and, and white asparagus. Exactly. <laughs> oh, so, oh, you know that the white asparagus in Basel. I. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, I'll vice oh, issues. <laughs> but they, they, they grow up and they're produces in a very very small time in a year, and yeah. so you have to grab them. As, as they as they well they Ernest Hemingway out, yeah. spent time there there's a yeah. famous bridge in Bassano yes. and I've spent a lot of time there because you don't know this my teacher was Tito Gobi and Tito Gobi was from Bassano del Grappa yes, exactly so I went there with him and and you know he was maestro professore dottore he was tutto Yes, I can, I, can, I can open a parenthesis. When I, when yeah. I uh, got my diploma in conducting, I started my little, little, little concerts and, and operas. My, my first opera was uh, uh, L'Amico Fritz, mm -hmm. directed by Eugenia Ratti. Do you remember her? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, yes, and, uh, she, she died, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. And then I, I, I won three international competitions. The second one, the Franco Capuana in Spoleto. So I had the, the, the chance to work in Spoleto. I don't want to be, I don't want to, to, be, to be long, but uh, I conducted in Spoleto, Oberto Ponte di San Bonifacio. And uh, you know, in Bassano, you have the Castello degli Ezzelini where Oberto Ponte di San Bonifacio was, was thought. Mm -hmm. This was the location of Verdi. And the uh, Opera Festival Bassano invited me to conduct the Oberto Conte di San Bonifacio in Bassano. From, the, from that moment on, I conducted seven years, two operas a year, including Otello with Katia Ricciarelli and Gianfranco Cecchele. Wow. In 2001 was my second opera. And then one of my greatest experiences as a very young boy, very young conductor was Pagliacci with Gianfranco Cecchele. Wow. It was extraordinary. So it was, it was old. It was quite sick, but uh, if you if you could listen to his voice, you have, you would have been okay, amazed by him. And so, I, I I remember Gianfranco, and when they offered me Azira, I said, okay, Gianfranco Cecchele used to sing Azira, 
And I'm so sorry he passed away because I would have called him and said, Maestro, what, 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 what would you suggest me in, uh, in this opera? Do you have some advices? Can we discuss about this? But unfortunately- What listeners may not always know is that when you work in the performing arts, certainly music and opera, but all the performing arts, we turn to older people. I'm becoming one of those older people, but we turn to older people for their knowledge and their experience and their history. And, you know, sometimes for advice about what not to do, yeah. about things to yeah. avoid because yeah. it's problematic or passing on experience that I may have had that was negative to say, this is what happened to me. And therefore you don't want to do that. You want to try something else instead. Exactly. Um, and it's, it's an oral tradition. And the dance world is different because it has to be physically shown. Whereas in music, we can look at the score, look at the libretto, we can talk about it and share it without having to physically show it. So since you said the um, L'Amico Fritz, it has the famous Duetto della Ciliegia, the cherry yeah. duet. Yeah. Since you were in Bassano del Grappa so much, did you go to Marostica? I went everywhere because because I, Marostica that time, is yes. famous for its cherries. Yes, cherries and and the chess the chess field. Do you famous chess that? board where they yes, play the human chess. chess. Yeah. Yes, exactly. In the piazza. Well, I uh, as I started in in Bassano after two years, I was appointed a chief conductor of the Orchestra Filarmonia Veneta, was the regional orchestra. In Vento, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting back to the uh, earliest 2000, so more than, more than 20 years ago. And uh, I had the chance to work a lot in Veneto, opera and symphony concerts all over the Veneto, uh, Bassano, Padova, Teatro Verdi, uh, Teatro Comunale Mario del Monaco di Treviso, and then, and then I, I was invited uh, to La Fenice di Venezia, but this is another story. Uh, because La Fenice was my very first opera house I worked I worked with in Italy. Um, you, one of the fourteen you were you were mentioning uh, before. And I left out Torino among the fourteen. Torino, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> also there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, by um, by being appointed a music music director, I had a chance to to work a lot in that region. So I I I I, I went everywhere: Marosti, Catiene, Schio, Bassano, Vicenza, Belluno, everywhere. I but did you Marosti. go to Rovigo? Of course, I conducted in Rovigo. Okay, so talk about the theater in Rovigo. Rovigo, for people who don't know, it's in the southern part of, of the Veneto. Yes. It's practically and Katia Ricciarelli comes from there. She was born there. That's you know? part of why yeah. I'm raising it. Yes. Yeah. Rovigo yeah. is a town where Renata Tibaldi started there. It's a town historically where many of the great singers began. Exactly. That's true. And Rovigo it is 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 crazy because if you take a look at the brochure of the of the upcoming season, you will you will notice season number 198 mm -hmm. can you imagine yeah rovigo is a very small opera house in a very small town uh, but uh, uh, surrounded it, by eel yeah. and anguilla and, and corn yes. <laughs> and <laughs> wild ducks that fly over that they shoot out of the sky yeah. to eat it's yes. a very particular place. Yes. <laughs> and it becomes to the Circuito the Lirico Veneto because they, they made a sort of um, uh, cooperation among the small opera houses because it's very important to, to raise money and to, and to use money properly because money are getting lower and lower and lower and lower nowadays. And they're very they're heroes because Audience is loyal, audience is present, but it's not enough. Without money, those opera houses cannot survive. Yeah. So back to Alcira, is there anything we've left out? Because listeners, I think even opera professionals just don't know it. No. So what would you tell them to listen for, to look for in this opera? I mean, basically the story is, 
um, the Spanish occupy yes, Peru, the Peru and the governor and his son are captured and they're liberated by the chief or one of the chiefs of the local Incas yes. and Altira is a local woman yeah. and two men fall in love with her. She agrees to marry one. The other one comes and stabs him. And as he's dying, rather than revenge, rather than vendetta, the yes. dying man says, go ahead, you marry Alcira, it's okay. Yeah. So um, it has a bit of that Hernani ending in a way of dying, but it's giving his benediction anyway. It's yes. similar. Yes. I would suggest people to listen to, for example, the overture. The structure of the overture is very Verdiana, okay? Is it, it, it's, it, it's like listening to uh, Nabucco overture, those kind of, uh, of, uh, of over overture according to the, to the young Verdi way of writing. And then there are so many interesting chorus and uh, referring to the, to, the, to the Verdi style, very uh, Ruspante, how we say, you know? Very Ruspante is, um, how, how when you, you talk about that? a polo Ruspante, it's a free yes. range, <laughs> yes. it's a free range rooster. In other words, it's not refined, it's sort of countrified, but yes. that doesn't mean it's negative, but it means that it, it has a certain kind of outdoors kind yes. of, Exactly. rough and ready feeling I would rather say than Spante, like rough you know the, yes, yeah. can, in other words know. not like the first act of La Traviata no of course not yeah <laughs> Ruspante but very I, I, I find it very original very uh, very touching very powerful there are so many chorus uh, within this opera the first chorus for example is uh, Moya Moya coperto di insulti gli americani and then Giunse uh, del Lidio Spano, the concertato, the first act that is very demanding for the baritone. And La Scena La Cavatina di Alzira, very powerful, Tutto in Sol Dolore Begliante. There are many, many extracts that people can listen to before, before getting their own idea on this opera. Okay, we have to admit that the opera is not the best masterpieces written by Verdi. I wouldn't even say that. I would just let people arrive and come yeah. to their own conclusion because if we tell them don't have expectations, no. then they won't. I won't do it. I won't do it. when I will, I will simply say and, you're going to discover something fascinating that you've never heard before and how lucky we are to hear this. I, I, mean I that. think that people should run to Liege yeah. to listen to this opera. <laughs> Do it because Liège is a very is a very beautiful very beautiful opera house. Our audience is fantastic. They're so enthusiastic all the time, and we will do our best to pull out the greatest result, the, the greatest effect of this music. Not doing uh, pyrotechnic uh, effects. I don't need it. I never done it, but to uh, let people. Uh, uh, get to this music and un fully understand this music. I think we will do it and we can do and it. And there is very good food in Liège. So when people go there, it's not just for the opera. <laughs> no, 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 no. Very, very so, good restaurants around. I, I, There are many things I could ask you. And some other time you and I are going to sit down maybe in a public place and talk just about Umberto Giordano. Because yes. I've discovered you and I share a passion for that composer oh, too. My God. Good but bumps. Good bumps. Me too. I, he's, I love Umberto Giordano, but not for today. We'll do that maybe another time. Yeah. But I know that you, in between learning these scores and heading to opera houses and so on, are also studying to be a pilot <laughs> to fly planes. Yes. I'm Why? a well-known conductor. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, sorry, I'm a very well-known conductor also for... Uh, being uh, a rider, I love motorbikes, but I, I had uh, six Ducatis, no other, no other motorbikes, you know, and uh, I used Just to... So people hear that he had six Ducatis. Ducatis, six, <laughs> uh, six models, one of them. I, I, I spent a lot of money because I, 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 wa I wanted to work to buy a motorbike. And, uh, but now I, I, used to, I used to ride a lot. I went everywhere, 
But now uh, I have become very busy and I cannot, uh, um, I don't want to keep a motorbike and I cannot use. Therefore I sold them and I'm not riding uh, anymore. But the second reason is riding a motorbike is very dangerous. Yes. If, if you fall down, if you drop by yourself, whatever happens, uh, you are the victim. Not, not the uh, car. Uh, Unfortunately, car the wonderful, he was a friend of mine, Salvatore Licitra, the Sicilian yes. tenor, the, yes, I died know. I in know. a motorbike accident. And, and we were friends and that was very tragic. Yes. So I made yeah. up my mind and say, never more, never more. At the same time, a new passion came up. Uh, it occurred uh, more than five years ago, but I was so busy and I say, okay, I won't do it. I, I have no time. I'm, I have no concentration. I have no time. But the pandemic uh, arrived and I was stuck at home in Switzerland. Uh, we were lucky because we were able to go out and experience fresh air. In Italy, they were locked up yeah. And they could never, they, 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 were, they weren't able, they just could go out for going to the supermarket, nothing else. And uh, I was sitting on my sofa and say, maybe it's, the good, it's, it's a good time to, to, to study, to apply. And I went to the flight school of Lugano and I applied. I started studying the theoretical um, uh, for example, uh, uh, aerodynamics, uh, medicine, uh, meteorology, very, very interesting matters. And at the same time, I, I, I began flying with my instructor. Normally, it takes uh, one year, one year and a half. But I think it will take, for me, uh, uh, one year more to, to get the license because I cannot fly every week. Uh, and uh, I have to fly a total of minimum 45 hours. At the moment, I flew 22 hours. And I am about to, to face my first solo flight, but I still have to train because giving uh, an airplane to a pupil without, without an instructor next to you can be a very, very important responsibility. You know, there you are know, many, the, many, many uh, colleagues of mine that uh, get, got the, the license. One of the professors of the Teatro, Teatro La Scala has the license, Michael Fabiano. The I was about to say, I know Michael, and he yeah. has been flying for many years, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Tenor, but I, yeah. You know, you know, Fred, I, in Seattle, I, could, I, I, had two, I, I experienced two times the flight because I was invited by a donor of Medina, she is in Medina, and she said, "Okay, if you're free, come, and uh, you can you can drive with this, with with a pilot the uh, seaplane in Seattle." So I <laughs> I, mm. I made this experience fantastic, uh, taking off and landing on water, and wow. also a friend of the Seattle Opera. He he uh, he's a pilot, and he owns a Cessna One A Two R G, and so we flew from from King County Airport towards the island snowbound and he, and he gave me the command uh, I was so so shocked so excited but it takes time I, did I you happen to more. visit Boeing the famous airplane manufacturer in Seattle of course the Museum of flies and yeah. the Boeing uh, the, the Boeing uh, factory in the same day I went there. no wonder you like Seattle so much. I, I fell in not just for the no, salmon no, the no, flying no. fish as they called them no, no, <laughs> Seattle. No. People, the opera house, the, yeah. the quality and everything. I fell in love. Quality of life is wonderful there. Everywhere in Seattle. Yeah. You know, Fred, I was supposed to make my American debut two years ago in 2020. My first debut in the United States was supposed to be in Chicago Lyric Opera. Tosca with Sandra Radvanovsky, but it was canceled. And it was postponed in 2024. As well, my debut at Teatro La Scala, I made my debut in March with the Diran Le Couvreur, but I was scheduled in 2020, Tosca with Anna Netrebko, it was canceled due to the pandemic.
I have dear friends who attended the Adriana and loved it, and they spoke about you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that I was part, that. part of why I wanted to have you on. So a question that comes to mind, I don't even know how to drive. That is yeah. a choice I made in my life, not to learn how to drive. Um, and therefore, I can't fly a plane. I can ride on a bicycle. But um, it must be a very different emotional and physical experience where you are leading a group of people as a conductor and you have the baton in your hand, yeah. as opposed to a piece of technology where you have the controls in your hand, yes. but you are in charge in both situations, yes. but the entire emotional, maybe intellectual experience is different. Have you thought about the differences between flying an orchestra, so to speak, and or flying an opera and flying a, a plane? This is a very interesting question. Thank you for making this. Um, well, the difference between flying and the music, oh, I can say, firstly, that after music, flying is one of the most wonderful thing in life. <laughs> I can say, uh, I can say, I can say that. Well, when you conduct, you have human beings in front of you. You have sens uh, different sensibilities, different, different preparation. Every orchestra is an organism, an organized organism, and they have their own, uh, their own uh, personality, their own preparation and so on. So the conductor is a leader. They lead them. They're not eating them up. They're leading them. And with the bottom, you can express your personality, your point of view, but dealing with, with uh, people who react differently, you know? The airplane is a machine that does what you want, only what you want. If, if, if there is something wrong, it's your fault. The, 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 the airplane is, is meant to be uh, conducted, is meant to be, um, to be led only by the pilot. If there is something wrong, it's your fault. This is the difference between flying and conducting. I love that. Now, I always feel with conductors that I can speak to them for 10 hours and they remain fascinating. That happens to be part of the breed of conductors. But we do, are, we're close to winding up our time, but I wanted to call listeners' attention to something. As they know, I very often ask my guests to select music from the Adagio catalog that is either particularly inspiring or meaningful. And there are several selections from Puccini's La Boheme. There's Verdi's Requiem with wonderful singers, Antonio Papano conducting. Um, there is Mahler's Second Symphony, The Resurrection, with my hero, Claudio Abbado, conducting. Verdi is my composer hero, and Abbado is my conductor hero. Yes. But there are two other selections that now I think I understand better why. One of them is Stravinsky's Le Oiseau de Feu, the firebird, because firebirds fly. Yeah. And then the other one is Wagner's Der Fliegende Holländer, the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> if, you, if you give me just 30 seconds, I can explain. Yes, please. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, um, La Boheme is one of my uh, favorite operas because it has been the opera that uh, featured my debut in. Uh, most of the uh, opera houses I, I have made my debut. Everywhere was La Boheme. Pavarotti and, too, the same thing with him. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Verdi Requiem is something that touches my heart all the time because uh, it was dedicated to Alessandro Manzoni's death. And uh, I'm just going to say I, that some people heard Alessandro Manzoni, Italy's great 19th century writer, Exactly. from Lecco, who wrote uh, The Betrothed, The Promessi Sposi, which if Verdi was to Italian 19th century music, Manzoni was to 19th century Italian language and literature. And Verdi was devoted to Manzoni. He adored it. It, it took him in, a, in the highest esteem. And so he dedicated this masterpiece that I had the luck to conduct three times in my life 
The last time was in Wiesbaden just a few months ago and uh, uh, in a Festival de Peralada three years ago in Spain. It was one of my greatest experience. Then we have uh, Mahler, the resurrection. It was, uh, I think, one of the, my greatest emotions because we, 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 we performed it at Teatro Petruzzelli in Bari and I had 193 people in front of me. Mm. Can you imagine? Chorus, orchestra, um, stage, stage banda, and so on. And when you are, when you are, uh, uh, in, uh, when you get in touch with, with this powerful music, you say, okay, God exists. And God was Mahler. That was my first uh, Mahler symphony ever. That why I, that why, that's why I, I chose it. Uh, the Firebird was the final, um, uh, the final uh, of the Dimitri Mitropoulos competition. I participated in uh, 1998 and won it. I was 25 years old. The chair, uh, chairman of the jury was Sir Neville Marner, mm -hmm. who uh, gave me a lot of uh, uh, love and, and, and advice and so on. And he said, choose this for your final. And I conducted as a very young boy, the, the Firebird. The mm -hmm. last one is the Fliege the Hollander because in Bari I had the occasion, I had the chance to conduct my very first partner. Yannick Kokos was the director, a very, very good cast. Okay, this is uh, much easier than Tristan Parsifal because, because the writing, the, 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 the structure of the of Fliege the Hollander is similar to the Italian operas. So it was my first experience, and it was a successful. So uh, that's. But not I, because it was the Flying Dutchman. Yeah, Flying Dutchman and the, and the and the and the the Firebird. Uh, okay, so <laughs> since before we go, since you bring up Tristan and Isolde, yeah, um, I watched a conversation with you recently, that in Italian that you said something that I always thought, but I never heard it confirmed, but you confirmed it. You were talking about Andrea Chenier, that beloved opera by Umberto Giordano you're conducting in Genova, the Carlo Felice. And you don't know, but I live near there when I'm in Italy. I lived in, in Liguria. Yeah. And um, so I know that theater very, very well. And I've seen many productions there of Andrea Chenier. You remarked about how the famous Tristan chord yes. enters very late in the opera. Would you talk about that? Because I, I love what you said. Yes, it's not my discover. is uh, is something very very known uh, worldwide. He uh, he used exactly the same structure of the uh, Tristan chord in a situation in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a very specific part of the opera and I think is a sort of homage of, uh, of, of Giordano to, to, to that opera. I couldn't say anything else, but the, uh, the, the, the presence, the, this chord is very evident. If you close your eyes and listen to that part of music, you recognize and it. And is this where Madalena and Chenier say de la morte, de la morte, exactly. viva exactly. la morte in exactly. exactly. uniting love and death. Yes. Yes. Which to me, I don't want to say the greatest love duet in all of opera, but one of the greatest love duets in all of opera yes. is the finale of Andrea Chenier. Exactly. And I heard a little reference to the act two duet in Tristan and Isolde. Yeah. And that's, thank you. <laughs> something, something, something very, very, very similar. As Michelangelo said when he was 82 years old, Ancora imparo. I'm still learning. Ancora imparo. And don't let's not forget Fedora. I fell in love yes. with Fedora. I conducted at the Kunstgebouw last year, and the music is so wonderful, so powerful, so full of love and passion and jealousy, and 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 so on. Let's the Metropolitan Opera remember. is doing a new production of it on New Year's Eve of this year. I believe I'm taking this out of my head that Marco Armiliato is conducting and Sonia yes. Yanchova is starring. A particular thing about the opera um, Fedora is that it includes a pianist on the stage. Yes. And what fantastic. opera companies often do is they get a very famous pianist. It's kind of like the middle of Flatermouse where you have a famous singer come out. Yeah. In Fedora, you have a famous pianist come out. 
Um, did you do something like that in Amsterdam or no? Yes, yes, we had a very good piano player because the part is very demanding. So the cadenza, the cadenza can be can be played by himself without with a conductor. But when he accompanies the, 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 the two singers, he has to be a very good musician because he has to listen to them. It, 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 it makes no sense that the conductor is conducting the part because uh, it, it's, very, it's very slow and very easy. But at the same time, we need a very good musician and I have one in, in, in Amsterdam. Who was it or do you recall the name or I'm putting you on the spot to recall? I don't remember the name. Okay, sorry. that's okay. Well, Giampaolo Bizanti, grazie infinite. Thank you very much for this illuminating conversation. As I said, I always love talking, talking to conductors because maestro also means teacher. And I learned so much from all of you and, and especially you today. And I'm so, I'm so happy you know Italy so well. Thank you very much for as they say in, in Attila, avrai tu l'universo, resti l'Italia me. <laughs> esatto, esatto, esatto. Grazie, so, Fred. Buon lavoro. Uh, just mention, I, I think you told me that you're going to Oman to conduct very soon. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm going there uh, with the Teatro Carlo Felice di Genova. Okay. We are, we are performing La Traviata. And when will that be? Uh, in in September. Very good. I recently had Umberto Fani, who's the Italian head of that company. Yes. And uh, so, yeah. buon lavoro, as we say in Italian. Keep up the good work, as we Thank say you. in English. It will be my third time in Oman. Third time. Congratulations. I love we look that. forward to I seeing you in New York as well. Okay. I'm looking okay. forward. <laughs>